Please note that any comments posted on the chat feed of the Council's YouTube channel during the recording of this meeting will not be monitored by the Council. All members have been provided with the remote committee guidance notes prior to the meeting. Please can these be adhered to during the remote meeting? Points include, all mobile devices should be switched off or set to silent so that the meeting is not interrupted by ringtones. Please switch your profile to mute unless you are speaking. If you wish to speak, please raise your hands in order that I'm aware that you wish to speak. For each item, the officers will present the report and then the committee will discuss it. After which, if there are any group leaders or deputy leaders present, they will be asked if they have any comments to make. And at this point, I would like to welcome Councillor Ansel and Councillor Lawrence, who are now joining the licensing team. So welcome. Thank you. Okay. Right, Kemi, is there any apologies for absence, please? Yeah, no apologies for absence. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any declarations of interest? No? No. Thank you. Minutes. Confirmation of the minutes of the licensing committee dated the 14th of November 2019. Now, the way we take the vote tonight, because of Zoom, it's going to be slightly different. I'm going to go to each councillor individually and ask, are you in favour, against or abstaining? And it will be done in alphabetical order, with myself and Councillor Sirola being the last two. So I will start with Councillor Allen, please. Are you in favour, against, or abstaining? In favour. Right. <clears throat> Councillor Ansel, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, You're very well. welcome. Uh, I, I, I abstain. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Green. Is that in favour, yes? Okay, I just can't hear you, but I can see you nodding your head. Councillor Holliman, please. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Cartman, please. Abstain. Abstain, thank you. Councillor Lawrence, please. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Don Morris, please. Don, can you hear me? Yeah. So, sorry, you, you you faded out a bit then, but yes, I'm in favour. I will bellow a bit louder. You're in favour. Good. Oh, no, no. <laughs> that won't solve. <laughs> OK. Councillor Sergeant, please. Councillor Sergeant. Councillor Sergeant. Sorry, I didn't unmute. In favour. Thank you. Then last, and then me, is Councillor Scarola, please. In favour. Thank you, and I'm in favour. So that is one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven in favour and three abstaining. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ah. Uh, Minutes four, minutes of the subcommittee, for members to know minutes of the various miscellaneous licensing subcommittees and Licensing Act 2003, and there is no vote on this. Uh, right, number five, review of delegations in relation to the licensing of animal activities. And the officer presenting this report is Rachel Graver. I'll just finish off and go to, and go to that one. And then number six, it's the out of areas private hire operators update. And uh, the officer presenting this will be Alex. Thank you. Over to you. Ah. Yes. That's better. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so the. <laughs> I'm going to 
hear that. I keep hearing myself. It's unusual, unusual experience. I'm hearing myself talking to me myself. Um, so yes, this is a report to review the delegations in relation to the licensing of animal activities. Rachel, you let Rachel we're just butt in there. We've still got two or three people with their microphones on. If they could turn them off, please. Is mine off? Yours is off, but it's coming out. It's coming out because I'm talking. I don't know. Can we do anything? I don't think we can do anything else, can we? Might be better off just going in another room. <laughs> we'll try again. Is that better? Right. So the, under the Animal Welfare Licensing of Animal Activities England regulations, which came into force during uh, 2018, they changed the way that we licensed animal activities. Oh, sorry, I'm going to have to move. <laughs> Excuse me. Can, just... can, is, is, is John Scarola got his microphone on? It seems to be frozen uh, because he's got his microphone on and also Beatles Galaxy has got a microphone on as well, which is messing up the whole uh, transmission of signals. It's just two people now who've both got their microphones on. One down, just one to go. I think I think Keith's um, microphone isn't working, which is why he's on twice. That's what oh, I gather from Kemi. Okay. Um, so we'll try this, uh, but I might have to leave the room because I can hear myself yes, echoing sorry. back. Rachel, are you in the same room with um, the? Um, yes, that's why. Yeah. Yes. Um, could you move further away, please? I... Or you could turn off your video, and we may hear you. Yeah. Turn off the video. Yeah, it works. Does it? Yeah. Oh, it's still echoing. It's still echoing. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm going to try. Sorry, we're just pausing a minute. We can see if we can get a headset for Councillor Clancy. Just bear with us, please. Uh, Rachel, sorry, if you need a headset, I think there's one attached to the computer that Simon normally sits on in licensing. Have we lost uh, Don again as well? I'll check. Um... See him. I can't see Councillor Morris. I think um, we've lost him. Yeah, he's, he's, he's completely disappeared off my screen at the moment as well. Yeah, he's not here. I would, uh, he'll probably try and join us again. Right. I 
I think that should be better now. Oh, good. I can't hear myself anymore. So we're just waiting for Councillor Morris to come back. Is that right? Please continue. Um, because Just continue recording. anyway. Yes, please. Okay, right. Yeah. I apologise for that. I, I really couldn't concentrate because they came my voice coming in my other ear. Um, yeah, so to do with the Animal Welfare Licensing of Animal Activities, England regulations came into force in October 2018. And we brought a, a report to members at that time, really just to run through what the uh, new legislation would entail, but also to institute a scheme of delegation under the regulations. What we're doing now is to bring that sc proposed scheme of uh, delegation back um, and really seeking the agreement of members to review that scheme in line with other uh, areas of the service where we have officers who are suitably qualified to make um, relevant decisions. So in relation to other areas such as food safety and health and safety at work, uh, a large number of the decisions are taken by officers who have suitable qualifications. As part of the... Um, the animal licensing legislation officers are now required to have an additional qualification which officers are in the process of uh, going through at the moment we have a number of officers that are going to be undertaking that so they will be considered to be competent under the terms of the legislation so this is slightly more specialist than other areas of the licensing legislation that we deal with um, so the scheme of delegation is proposed at enclosure number two um, but I'm suggesting that we keep uh, involvement of the Chair of Licensing Committee with some of the more significant decisions around licence refusal um, and suspension of licence and revocation of a licence rather than placing that in front of the miscellaneous licensing subcommittee so that there is still some member involvement there. Just to uh, update members as well, because obviously it's been in place for some time now, the legislation, so um, currently we have around 71 businesses licensed under the new legislation, including 15 boarders, uh, 15 breeders, nine pet vendors, one doggy daycare, 25 domestic boarders, one riding establishment and uh, two licenses for animals for exhibition, which was also a new uh, activity for us, which was originally carried out by county. So we've actually seen a 20% increase in the number of licenses that we issue under the new legislation. Um, and we anticipate that there are probably more out there that we need to be finding that also need licensing, which we haven't found yet. Um, and that, that is, will be on the programme of work moving forward. Around half of these have achieved the five star rating. Again, that was a new introduction of the legislation. Um, whereby we also have to award a star rating to those businesses and, and say thankfully around half of those have achieved the five star rating and where they haven't we're working with the businesses to encourage them to achieve the higher standards. So that really is it for me was a was a succinct uh, overview of the licensing of animal activities. Are there any questions from members at all? Over to you now. Councillor Allen. I'll let, let read you there. Um, yeah, the, uh, you've altered the the, ta the table scheme of delegations there and brought, I see all those, and you've explained that um, we need more qualified people than actually the licensing committee or the miscellaneous licensing committee. Is, is, is that, have I interpreted that correctly? Can't hear you, Rachel. Can't hear you, Rachel. I've got too many mute buttons now. I've got two mute buttons to play around with. Um, yeah, so uh, please don't take that the wrong way. There's no, no uh, inference in terms of um, the subcommittee members. This is just to bring it in line with other parts of the service. So, for example, as I've already mentioned, we have to have officers with a certain level of competency for food safety um, and officers would make those decisions to close premises or to revoke licences. Um, and the same goes for health and safety at work. Again, officers would, would make their own decisions uh, because they have to reach a certain standard of competency. Um, so in relation to prohibition notices or, or service of improvement notices. So the idea is that to bring that into line um, for the animal licensing. But again, because this is a new competency requirement, it's changed the previous uh, legislation that related to animal licensing. Um, and that was the reason for bringing the 
the, the report to committee and for making the suggested changes to the delegations. Could could you is there an appeal process if uh, so if an officer refuses a license? Um, what's the business appeal procedure? There would be there is an appeal procedure as there would be for for most uh, licensing decisions. So um, it would be an appeal procedure to um, the magistrates' court. And obviously any decision that is taken is taken having regard to the full circumstances. So any decision that would be taken by a licensing officer has to be fully justified and given the reasons as to why they've actually made that decision. Um, and so the proposal is that that is still taken in consultation with the chair of licensing committee um, so that that decision can be published as part of that decision making process. OK, thank you. I have no other questions. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Any other members, please? Is, is that Councillor Sergeant? Do you wish to speak? Yeah, my hand is up. Oh, I couldn't see it. No, not my, this hand, the one on the machine. All right. Do you want to speak then? Yes, please, yes. Go on then. On the um, enclosure number two, I wanted to ask you, Chairman, uh, being as um, the officer scheme of delegation uh, will mainly be in consultation with yourself, which I am in agreement with. Mm. How do you feel about numbers four? Oh, number hands. four, because I, be, I be, that that doesn't that doesn't need. Maybe that's not such a a senior one. There's number four that doesn't need the um, the chairman's. What page is it, please? Well, it's it's um, enclosure number two. I don't know what page. Page seventy-two. Seventy. Page seventy-one and seventy-two. Thank you. Sorry. Ah, got it. No, I'm fine with this. Because some of them are the licensing committee. Mm. Uh, some of them are the subcommittees. Some of them mm. are with officers and yourself. And there are a few that are with our consultation uh, 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 with yourself. I do understand, am I right, Rachel, in thinking when we discussed this last, that that gives officers the power to act in a more uh, rapid manner rather than having to wait. Am I right in, in thinking that way? I think, uh, yes, I think that was it. I think it, I think there's an element of timing, but there's also an element, as I say, of the, of the responsibility resting with the officer who's got the training, the appropriate training. Um, so I, I wouldn't have a problem particularly in terms of going to uh, the chair of licensing in relation to item five, I think it was, wasn't it? I wouldn't have a problem with that yeah. um, because, again, I think it just it, it provides some char some transparency there. Item um, and hope that is, is that a, a lesser, to a lesser degree? Item yes. Yeah, I wouldn't. I would expect that not to be. Officers. Yeah, I would expect that not to be contentious. I think if potentially variation of a license number five could, because you're doing that without the license holder's consent, they might be unhappy with the decision that's being taken. It really is just to give a bit of transparency of the decision making process. Um, so I wouldn't have a problem with amending that one at all. OK, right. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sergeant. Any other members, please? No. Okay then. <coughs> well, she has no author in the name, let's say. I need more hands. Hang on. Kemi, do we need to get agree any amendment there or just agree? Do we need to? 
have a motion for that or? I've pressed it too many times now. Could you clearly state the amendment, please, Rachel? What was it? It was to amend uh, number five to uh, senior licensing officer in consultation with the chair of licensing committee. Senior. But he already has officer decision in consultation. So it's just to change the word to senior officer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that will be noted in, in the narrative. Oh, no. minute. Okay. Just in, interrupting there, in number five, you changed the, right the decision thing. to the service director. He moved it from chair of licensing to just to the service director because it's the far right hand columns, which are the new yeah. procedures. Yes. Yeah. So, so what what we would normally do is is normally under the under the council's constitution, it would be uh, it would start off with the service director. If it if it is going to um, to the department, it starts with the service director, and then we delegate down from the service director to officers. Now, I, I probably can I probably confuse things a little bit more than I should have done there. Um, so it was the idea was that it was just going to go to service director there for further delegation down, but we can keep it to senior licensing officer in consultation with the chair of licensing committee. Can can I please ask who may who put that amendment in? Because that the person didn't I didn't see the person ask for it, the licensing no, member. It's, it's, um, my Okay, sorry, it's because of what you just brought up, Councillor Sergeant, that this is happening. Is that okay? I can't hear anything. Chairman, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can. Can I just ask you then, Chairman? I, oh, yeah. Did you hear the person? I don't. Do you know who the person is? What what licensing committee member asked for that amendment? Now, the only reason that they're bringing this up now is because of what you've just said. That's all. Yeah. Terry, they're assuming that you've made the amendment. Yeah. Oh, I didn't make. I didn't make an amendment. Don't worry about it. Oh, I was quite happy. Do you want to stick to the way it was, or do you, would you like an amendment then? Sorry, Rachel. Did I did I have you thinking that I yes. wanted an amendment? Yes. No, I I just wanted to know that um, if the chairman was happy with it. Yes. And I, you know, if, if you feel that that person's qualified with training. I do. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing, if I, you know, then Rachel, I'm quite happy with it as it is. I didn't win. <laughs> Thank no, you, Chairman. Worry. You're welcome. <laughs> right. Right. Any other members? No? Right. Do, I'm going to take the vote the same as before then, please. So I'll start with Councillor Allen, Alphabetic call, And I'm going to ask those in favour, those against and those abstaining. So starting with Councillor Allen, please. So, sorry, what, what are we voting for? On the recommendation one on page 65, that the committee approves the proposed revised scheme of delegation submitted at enclosure number two. So I say yes, I approve that. I'm in favour of that. Okay, thank you. Right. Councillor Ansell next. Four, Chairman. Thank, thank you. you. Councillor Holloman. Uh, yes, agree. Lovely. Councillor Kirkman. I vote for Chair. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Four, please. Thank you. Councillor Morris. Don. 
Councillor Morris. Hello, Don. He's waiting to unmute himself. Just a minute, please. Okay. Four. Thank you. Councillor Sergeant. Four. Thank you. Then Councillor Scrolla. In favour. And me as well. So that's unanimous. Thank you, councillors. I think you missed uh, Councillor Green there, Clancy. Just to double check. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Thank you for that. Gosh, I don't know how I did that. Never mind. Right. So we're now on to uh, number six. Out of areas, a private hire operators update. Officer presenting the report is Alex, please. Thank you. Where's Alex? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so this report provides an update for members um, of the actions taken following the License Committee on the 18th of September 2019 in relation to the issue of out-of-area private hire vehicles working within the Basildon Borough, particularly those working under the Uber banner. So this report will provide an overview of the situation and the actions taken following the decisions agreed on the 18th of September. And there is also a summary of the legal position as well. There are some recommendations, but I'll go over those at the end. Um, so the report um, is the full committee report is shown um, as background papers to this um, and it provided information on what the council will be able to do to support the local trade in recognising that the out, um, out of area private hire vehicles working in Basildon undermine the local standards that have been implemented to promote public safety within the borough. So predominantly we're seeing issues um, with uh, vehicles licensed with TfL. Um, uh, mainly working under the Uber banner. Um, the, the council resolved that the committee note the contents of the report and the steps already been taken by the officers. That the committee agreed that a letter be sent out on behalf of the chair of the committee the to the relevant Minister of State expressing concern regarding the current legislative framework. The committee agreed that a further letter be sent on behalf of the chair of the license committee to the Transport of London, setting out the concerns that Basman Council have. The committee also agreed that both these letters to be shared with the local government association with a view to supporting ongoing lobbying of the government in relation to updating the legislation. The committee also agreed that a letter be sent to Uber and any out of town operators who are known or believed to be working within Basildon asking them to withdraw from Basildon or apply for an operator's license with Basildon Borough Council and seeking clarifications of the reasons for their failure to apply for a license with Basildon. The committee continued to liaise with other local authorities around the steps that they are proposing in relation of out-of-town operators to identify possible opportunities for joint working and shared learning and that a meeting be convened between members of the licensing committee and members of parliament and trade representatives to raise issues around um, out-of-town operators in regards to public safety. So the current situation in regards to Uber, TfL have refused to renew Uber's operator's license, and this was on the 25th of November, 2019. Um, and it is shown, uh, the press release is shown as enclosure two. Um, they found that Uber London Limited to not to be fit and proper to hold a private hire operator's license. Is our understanding that Uber are currently appealing that decision, and whilst that decision is being appealed, they can still continue to trade. Um, under the resolved steps that we, um, the licensing committee requested and, and agreed to, um, on the 16th of October, a letter was sent out to Uber on behalf of the chair of licensing committee, and this letter is shown as enclosure three. No response was received from Uber, and a second copy was sent to Uber on the 27th of January, 2020. To date, we've not received any response, response to either of these letters, and it is likely that Uber ex exercising their discretion not to reply, pending the outcome of the appeal hearing in relation to the refusal of the TfL operator's license. Um, in regards to the Secretary of State, on the 29th of October again, a letter was sent to the Secretary of State of Transport on behalf of the Chair of Licensing, requesting an urgent need to review the legislation in relation to hackney carriage and private hire drivers, vehicles and operators. This letter is shown as enclosure four. A uh, response was received on the 24th of January, 2020 from the Baroness Beer, um, and she is the Transport Minister for Road and Security. This letter is shown as enclosure five. 
and the response outlines the steps the government has taken over recent years, which includes the task and finishing group on taxi private hire licensing. Okay. Uh, Baroness B. Sorry, can you hear me? Oh, no, sorry for interrupting. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, Baroness Veer confirmed that a bill being uh, being brought uh, forward legislation form was not on the Queen's speech for this session, although consideration was being given to what further actions can be taken and will continue to engage with the sector. To date, the revised statutory guidance has still not been issued. Um, the letter that was sent to Transport of London, um, and that is shown as enclosure six, um, no response was received and we sent a second one on the 27th of January. And on the 27th of April, an email response was received from TfL and is shown as enclosure eight. In regards to cross-border hiring, they're in agreement that this is a significant challenge affecting not only London, neighbouring licensing authorities, but many others across England, Wales, that are under the current private hire legislation. Although they agree it is perfectly legal, legal TfL are in a complete agreement that the situation undermines local licensed trades and presents a risk to public safety and restricts the enforcement capacities of local licensing authorities and have stated they have actively lobbied government for a change in legislation to tackle cross-border hiring. TfL are currently awaiting the outcome of the government consultation on statutory guidance and will continue to lobby for legislation to address cross-border hiring. TfL would welcome our support on this issue, which I believe, um, you know, I, I believe that the committee would be agreed that they would support TfL. TfL carry out compliance operations across London boroughs and conduct joint compliance operations with other licensing authorities where possible. And a colleague from their taxi and private hire compliance team has contacted us on the 28th of April to introduce themselves and will be getting back in touch with us when the coronavirus situation is settled in order for us to work together on issues that may have come up in the past. And this is also shown as enclosure nine. Uh, TfL have stated um, they do have a few standards that are similar to ours um, and they are um, require their drivers to meet a range of licensing requirements. In response to Uber, TfL have reiterated they had taken a decision to not to license Uber as a private hire operator. However, this matter is subject to Magistrates Court Appeal and it would be inappropriate for TfL to discuss this at, any, um, at this time. Both these letters for the Secretary of State and the Transport of London been shared with the local government association as directed by the members. Um, in February this year, a letter was sent out to one of the private hire operators licensed with Castle Point, whose vehicles are licensed under Castle Point and predominantly appear to work within the Basin area. A copy of this letter is shown as enclosure seven and as yet no response has been received. In regards to working with the other local authorities, um, we work quite closely with the Joint Essex Licensing Officer Forum. This has been on the agenda and currently a policy is uh, trying to be put in place where we have joint authorizations across uh, across the council. So we would be able to enforce on uh, council point vehicles and in, in within our area and castle point, for example, would be able to enforce on our vehicles within castle points area. Um, and we're hoping to stretch this all across Essex um, and include TfL now that we have um, some good contacts with them. Um, the meeting with the members of the parliament and trade representatives Again, unfortunately, due to the recent general election, this recommendation was postponed. And then since making contact um, for a suitable date and time has proven difficult for all parties to agree on. Um, and um, as I haven't stated in here, obviously coronavirus has hit, so it's become more difficult to arrange that meeting. The recommendations of my report is that the council members, uh, that the members note the contents of this report and the steps already been taken by the officers and agree that a letter be sent to members of parliament outlining the issues faced by outdated legislation, cross-border hiring and out of area private hire operators. Um, that's the end of my report. Has anyone got any questions? I think Councillor Sergeant, yeah. I'm on YouTube. Thank Can you, you hear me? Oh, you should yeah, thank you, Chairman. I wasn't sure whether you'd seen the hand up. Okay, thank oh, you. Oh, Lindsay um, did. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, thank you for that, um, Alex. I just wanted to ask, in your opening remarks, when you referred to the uh, recommendations, um, you spoke of letters. Um, is the recommendation here 
just that we note the contents of the report and send a letter to MPs, or were you proposing other letters? I might have got that wrong. Uh, no, sorry, Councillor Sergeant. I was um, I went over the previous recommendations and what was um, what was agreed oh. by members. Um, and obviously what action we've taken following those recommendations. Um, the current recommendations for this report is just to note the contents of this report and the steps that we've already taken and to agree that a letter be sent to members of parliament outlining the issues that we currently have. Um, if I may uh, just say, uh, Chairman, uh, mm -hmm. thank you for that. I wondered what that was about because I saw in there, but um, yeah, so I just, that's clarified. No problem. I'm really pleased. We are hearing from TFL because that's a kind of glimmer of hope. Yes. And hopefully once we get out of the pandemic, we can make contacts. And once we write to um, the MPs, so there are, when you say the um, members of parliament, are you talking about the three that represent the Basildon area? Uh, yeah. You know Sorry, it would be the three members of parliament um, that we were previously going to contact that represent the Basildon area. And um, just for clarification, this letter will go on council headed paper. It will be from the chairman, but from Basildon Council. Uh, I, haven't got a, I haven't got a problem with that. No, I know you haven't. I just didn't want it on political paper like you did last time. <laughs> okay, point made. Right, any other members, please? No members? Before I come to Mr Beadle? It looks like the floor is yours, Keith. Um the letters that you're sending to the MPs, is that going to include the copies of the letters that you've sent out to the out-of-area yeah. operators, um, st specifying that they have not replied to you, they are ignoring you, and therefore they're just basically <clears throat> passing over local licensing. They're just ignoring it. I agree. So I will say yes, it all should be included to the MPs, to get a fuller picture as well. So that's a yes. And, and just secondly, um, the Castle Point vehicles that are working within our area are actually working for an operator that's already licensed by Basildon. Um, there is a condition four that has been brought up on numerous occasions which says you can't give a job to an outside area vehicle until all your locally licensed vehicles have got a job or they're unavailable for the work. Mm -hmm. But there doesn't seem to be any... Um, checks that uh, are going far enough to push the operator to say, well, basically you're in breach of your local licence by bringing in these vehicles because you're giving them work when you've got a Basilan licence vehicles already sitting around available for that work. Right. Can you answer this one, please, Alex? If you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll do. When we go out and do private hire operator checks, um, we tend to go to the office... Um, and we look through the booking system um, um, and have a look to make sure things are booked, how they're doing the cross-border hiring, so how they would be transferring it from one operator to another. Um, so this would be something that we would uh, spend more time doing. Um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we haven't been able to enter into um, their premises. Their premises have actually been closed um, um, mm -hmm. and we haven't been doing inspections in, in, inside premises currently. Um, so as soon as we can, we will be looking more into this condition for that Mr. Beadle brought up. Yes, Keith. Sorry, it just as follow up to that. Um, the licenses are up for renewal around September. Mm -hmm. um, are, are the council going to issue a license um, a full licence for the five years if, if we were still in the pandemic and they were unable to get in and do those checks or sh are they going to issue a temporary licence until those checks have been carried out? Alex? Um, I will have to have a look at that. Um, I don't believe we can issue a temporary licence. The licences are five-year licences. However, we could look to um, uh, discuss whether they are fit and proper and look to 
um, bring before um, a licensing committee, a licensing subcommittee um, on the grounds of fit and proper and um, breaching of conditions. Keith, any other questions, please? No, that's fine, thank you. Members, any other questions? Councillor Holliman, please. Um, thank you, Chair. I do have a question, but it doesn't really concern what we've just been talking about. I don't know whether you want to still take that or not. I'm happy. OK, uh, just a very general one, really. Um, mm. I think members here would probably have picked up on the media recently about the concerns um, that exist between uh, taxis uh, of various types and the screen being placed between the driver and the passenger. And I'm just wondering whether uh, this is something we as a licensing authority have addressed, if we've got any uh, particular thoughts on it, um, really just to find out what we can say if somebody approaches us Could with that question. With the virus one. Right. Oh, yeah. thank you, Councillor. Alex? Yeah, so there are screens um, available. There are many different types. So they go from solid ones to flexi-glass ones and plexiglass ones. Um, there are so many out there. Um, we are allowing screens to be fitted into vehicles, but there are certain conditions. Um, they have to be fitted correctly. Um, they would need to check with their insurance that they allow the modification. Um, it cannot block any safety features at the rear of the vehicle. So, for example, if it's got any rear uh, airbags in the headrest, they wouldn't be able to put a screen up. Right. Um, they would also still need to be uh, aware that they to clean the inside of their vehicles as well, because it's not just a screen to protect them and the customers. They also still need to make sure that they are regularly cleaning the rear of the vehicle. Um, and and um, on every occasion, we've been looking at the fitting of these as well. So they're normally bringing them to me to have a look at um, just to make sure they're fitted correctly. They would uh, clear and see through. So um, they're not being fitted by themselves. And if they are, that they're in a very good um, standard and that it's not going to cause any extra um, hazards to the members of the public, for example, any suffocation risk if it comes loose mm -hmm. or any risk if... Um, 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 or on, on the knees if it's a solid one or anything else like that for members of the public. I'd like to thank Councillor Holliman for bringing this up. It was a very valid point and thank you. Could, could I just come back on yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I, I'm just wondering now though whether uh, we have opened up a bit of a can of worms here on this one because um, as you intimated there there are several screens available and of course there are many different vehicles that this needs to be fitted into um, safety is the main issue here and when I say safety I'm not really even considering the virus issue I'm considering the implications of a piece of rigid plastic uh, which is being positioned in a vehicle I don't know how this is being put in. Do we issue um, guidance to drivers or is there a company which we've actually sponsored in some way of actually fitting these in? Um, I, I could go on and many, many questions in this one, but I think you get the rough idea here that we, we have embarked upon something which um, has the potential of biting us back at some point, unless we're really on top of this one. Thank you. Okay, so probably Alex next, and Keith, if you would like to come in afterwards on this, if you yep. would be good. Thank you for your points of view. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you. We have been checking. So for the rigid ones, um, we don't uh, haven't really had any. They've been the flexible ones more um, than the rigid one. Um, I've had a couple of rigid ones come into me. Um, I've specifically asked for the safety um, specs of the um, of the maker models. Um, I normally check to make sure that they are um, able to be fitted into that particular um, type of vehicle. Um, 
and and then obviously we check them as well um there is a company um the nearest one i think is in uh leon c um that are fitting the rigid ones but as yet i haven't really had any uh, rigid ones they've all been the flexible um flexible ones that aren't aren't rigid thank you alex um, i'd like your input on this please keith yeah um the screens from day one really we've been working with alex uh, talking to her quite regularly looking at screens um the vehicles that have had them um alex says she said inspected um those screens i believe all meet european safety standards um so it's just the fitment part of the screens into the vehicle which is the the concern um we've seen pictures of people basically putting polythene now none of these pictures come from basin taxis or private hire drivers they're from other areas and hence why the councils may have shut down some of their areas very quickly but none of the screens as far as i'm aware that are fitted to the vehicles um have not been inspected by alex alex has put it out um or the licensing have put it out regularly to tell everybody that if you're going to fit a screen, then you should be contacting the council for those to be looked at. Um, it was something that we pushed with the licensing just to make sure, because obviously we have concerns about airbags. Some of the Mercedes have airbags in the headrests. And if you put a screen right across the back up against those headrests, then the airbags are going to cause problems. So the screens need to be worked in a certain way. Um, Today, we've just got more information come through um, from the National Association that says that the World Health Organization has acknowledged there's emerging evidence that the coronavirus can be spread by tiny particles suspended in the air. If the screen is not 100% mm -hmm. air blocking, then the virus is going to still carry on anyway. It's going to move around. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just it's all been updated all the time from what i've seen of what the council's been doing we've not had a problem with it okay I, the, so, sorry you, I, I know i know i'm in danger here of pushing pushing my luck a little bit on this one uh Councillor clancy but um uh I, I, it, it it opens up the, the second thread of where this goes to mm. which is um the abilities or the options that drivers have of cleaning the cab uh, between customers um, and uh, as you quite rightly say Keith you know that the, the virus uh, is air airborne and I now say that uh, with tongue in cheek because it can only be airborne if it is attached to something which in this case is, is going to be aerosol or something but Passengers in the back seat will be touching various things within that cab. And um, is there a policy or are we suggesting a policy from the council to say that between each customer or between every hour? Um, it, in other words, what is the current policy that we are suggesting for cleaning down the area between paying customers. Thank you. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just to uh, recap on the cleaning part from Councillor Holloman. Yeah, um, we have, whenever we've been talking about screens with them, we have also been reminding them to follow the government guidelines and the DFT guidelines um, to say they should be uh, cleaning the rear of the vehicles um, regularly. So that would include door handles, seat belts, uh, seat belt hooks, mm. um, anywhere where a passenger would touch. Um, everyone that we've spoken to has all the cleaning materials in the vehicle. They wipe down those screens. Sorry, my hands. <laughs> they wipe down those screens regularly um, in the rear of the vehicle. Um, so, yeah, they have been following that advice. And, and that's what we've sent out to them is the government advice and the uh, Department of Transport advice. Um, Secondly, with the screens, we were contacted by the National Private Hire Association um, asking us the question whether we would um, allow screens or not. Um, I went back to the National Private Hire Association and told them that it's not a simple question of yes or no. Yes, we do allow them. However, there are a number of um, safety features and, and recommendations that we have 
thus they need to be inspected by the council. So they have specifically put on their list for Basildon that yes, we do accept them, but they need to be inspected by Basildon Council um, before they are um, out on the road with them. Thank you, Alex. Okay. And, and are the drivers enforcing mask wearing? Uh, sorry, it's uh, currently not enforced. It's not enforceable. Um, that's for pri um, public transport, and the Department of Transport have said that hackney carriages and private hires are not public transport. It does say on their guidance that passengers should wear it, but it's not enforceable. We have sent around safety uh, posters for safety, uh, five tips for drivers and five tips for passengers that we worked with the Essex Resilient Team at County Council and other members across the um, Essex uh, licensing authorities. Um, and they have got these A5 wipeable posters they can put in the vehicle. And it does talk about passengers wearing face coverings. So it's face coverings, not face masks. Um, it is on each operators and each um, owner vehicle risk assessment, whether they insist on the passengers wearing a mask or not. Thank you. Uh, Keith, you indicated to speak. Yeah, I, I think mostly that, um, Alex has covered that, the part about Essex County Council sending out to all the councils in Essex, their five point uh, guide for drivers and passengers. Um, we are now getting more um, masks coming through. Initially, when it was all first happening, we were struggling to get masks. Mm. Um, but now we're getting them. More and more drivers are using the masks. Um, we've been getting extra paper ones. Um, and in some cases, supplying those to, uh, customers. Um, we have already spoken to licensing about our concerns. If we get somebody in who's obviously coughing quite a lot getting in your vehicle or sneezing quite a lot mm. what are the guidance on do we have to take them do we not have to take them would the driver be brought up in front of license so, so there's been a quite a lot of yeah. back and forth between ourselves and licensing and the guidance we've been getting because it is not legislation as they do not class taxis and private IRAs public transport mm. basically we could drive around without doing any of the things that we would think is common sense, but we have pushed the trade to use the common sense approach. I use wipe down disinfectants. I use a spray disinfectants for the floor. Um, we use, you know, the screens are cleaned and disinfected and, and so on. So I use a mask myself. A lot of the drivers who use masks, um, a lot of the customers, we're sitting at the train station, have worn the mask coming off the train station, walk outside the train station, take the mask off and then get in your taxi. Right. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's getting the, that to the customers to say you've got to start using your your mask. Mm -hmm. um, that may change again with more information coming through, whether it's the masks are any good anyway. It's another matter. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Any other members, please? Catch the sergeant, please. Um, yes, thank you, gentlemen. I just wanted to ask Keith, if I may, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, Keith, question one, how is trade? Hope it's picking up for you. And question two, can you refuse a passenger if they're not wearing a mask? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Keith. Uh, right. Um, just answer the second point first about if they're not wearing a mask. No, we can't refuse them. Um, only in the situation if they are showing obviously signs that they're coughing constantly, sweating, uh, signs that could be used to impress on you that they might be in COVID or whatever. So at that stage, we could we could refuse them. But just because they're wearing a mask, there is no legislation that says they have to wear a mask in a private hire or a taxi. So no, we couldn't do that. Um, the trade... Um, for the initial, or until the pubs opened a couple of weeks ago, um, we were on our knees and we've got large numbers of people that have left the trade, that have uh, not back lease cars, um, they're not working. It's just because, you know, we can't earn the money to pay the lease or the uh, HP on the vehicles. Um, with the pubs reopening, trade is coming up but it's still not at any sufficient level that we would say 
we can carry on like this for months and have a viable trade into the new year, um, especially with all the next generation of clean air vehicles and things that we're going to start be getting requirements for. The drivers are just not going to have the money to start buying those vehicles if this carries on for you know months and months. We go into a second phase when we start locking down again, and we could be in serious trouble. Well, I hope it doesn't come to that, but thank you, Keith. Any other members, please? Is that you, Alex? Do you want to say something? What's your... Sorry, oh, Councillor but... Nancy. Oh. Yes, please. Um, just to let you know in regards to the refusal, um, I sent an email out um, uh, to all the drivers on the uh, 15th of June, which um, included the top tips to the drivers, top tips for passengers and DFT guidance, Department of Transport guidance. So uh, the question of can a taxi or private hire driver refuse to admit a, tax, uh, a passenger who's not wearing a face covering, they're advised to make a risk assessment outlined in the transport operators guidance published on the 12th of May. The acceptance of a booking requested by a private hire operator is a decision based on the operator's own assessment of risk. So they'd say to them, they have to clearly tell them when they're making the booking, this is for private hire operators, when they're making a booking, um, that they must wear a mask if it is in their risk assessment that they ask them to do that. Um, there is also, I attached the taxi and private hire question and letter um, on there, and it does talk about can you refuse it. Again, it is all about risk assessment. Taxi drivers can use this risk assessment, so this will be Hackney carriage drivers, to determine whether or not it is reasonable to admit a passenger who is not wearing a face covering considering other mitigations they put in place for their risk own risk assessment. So this doesn't absolve them of their duties under the Equality Act. Um, but as I've said to Keith, if they were, if in their risk assessment for a Hackney carriage driver is that they would expect a passenger to be wearing a face mask, um, as long as it's sort of done in a polite manner um, and, and there's no, it's, it's not done in any particular way that they could complain about um, other, uh, the driver's conduct, um, the refusals, you know, they, they could look to refuse um, a passenger without a face covering if it is in their risk assessment. Thank you, Alex. Any other members or Keith? No? Okay, then we'll go to the vote. It's on page 75 B, because A is just for noting. Agree that a letter be sent to the members of parliament at lying the issues faced by outdated leg legislation, cross-border hiring and out of areas private hire operators. So it's going to be voting the same way as before and I won't wish you out Councillor Green again. Apologies for that. Right, starting with Councillor Allen please. Those in favour, those against, those abstaining. Favour. Favour. Councillor Ansell please. Four. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Green. Thank you. Councillor Holloman. Four. Thank you. Councillor Kirkman. I'm four. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Four. Thank you. Councillor Don Morris. Four. four. Thank you. Good. Councillor Sargent. Four. Four, Councillor Scrolla. Councillor Scrolla, please. John. Thank you. And me, I'm voting for. So that's unanimous. Thank you. Now, the next one, there is no vote to be taken on. And it is an update from uh, Rachel on the COVID 19. Over to Rachel. Thank you. I'll just give her a nudge, she's gone to sleep. <laughs> no, I've got, oh yeah, I've got COVID-19 update. Is that what should be on it? Ah, I can hear you, yes. No, I can't hear you, Rachel. Oh, that's better, that's it. I'm muted, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> You're not wearing a mask, are you? 
Oh, right, okay. Uh, right, okay. Um, so this is just a run through with members the uh, COVID update. Um, so I think the uh, updates have been given to each of the service area committees um, in relation to what's been happening as a result of uh, COVID and the response to COVID. So first and foremost, I want to say a massive thanks to Alex and the team. There's been an enormous amount of work to help to keep the service running um, during lockdown and also um, as we move towards some form of recovery as the restrictions have eased. Um, there's been a lot of work that's been carried out across the whole of the service but as I say um, particularly what uh, Alex and the team have been doing. So um, in common with the rest of the council everybody pretty much has been working from home since the start of lockdown that was that was achieved within the first two weeks of lockdown uh, something we've been talking about for a long long time um, saying oh are we going to be able to do it or well, it's a bit too difficult but actually we achieved it within two weeks so it shows it can be done when your mind is focused obviously not good circumstances to have to do it but it but it worked Throughout that time, phone contact has been maintained with customers, so the phone lines have been maintained. It's had its own challenges, a bit like Zoom, as we've experienced tonight. Um, and occasionally there's been challenges with, with our Skype, but uh, in generally the uh, phone contact has been maintained throughout. We've had to apply some of our processes a little bit more effectively. Um, and also some of the policies that we would normally apply. We, again, we have to be a little bit more flexible to enable service continuity. Um, and we've also obviously undertaken risk assessment of the way that we operate to make sure that we're not putting staff or um, the trades at risk. So um, during uh, lockdown particularly, uh, we were able to, with the support of Riverside at the depot to uh, continue with the MOTs and the compliance test at the depot. Um, I know we had some discussions early on because the um, Department of Transport lifted or, or, or um, eased the requirement on the need to have uh, MOTs carried out, um, but we were keen to keep them going from the point of view that it just created some level of assurance that vehicles were still being maintained when they were being used for passengers at the time, um, particularly in the early stages of lockdown. And uh, again, that's that's been kept going. Um, we've, we've listened to those drivers who have been isolating, self-isolating or shielding to make sure that we weren't putting um, unnecessary um, restrictions on them to still attend the MOTs uh, and compliance tests during that time. Uh, again, another challenge, something that we've always wanted to get done, and we and Alex and the team managed to achieve it quickly, was the processing of renewals through the submission of documents online and greater use of email communication, which I think actually has been quite supportive by the trade. I think there's been a general uh, appreciation of actually that's made their life a little bit easier. I'm sure there's some that that don't like it, but I think in general it's been it's been well received, um, and Alex has been. Uh, issuing regular updates on service changes, how we've been operating and trying to deal with the COVID related concerns to the taxi trade. I think Councillor Holliman obviously raised uh, concerns around the screens. There's been a lot of talk about what's a reasonable approach for the trade to take in relation to passengers. And let's face it, they've kept they've kept going. A lot of them have kept going through what's been a very, very testing time, um, allowing as always, strangers in their vehicles, they don't know whether or not they're asymptomatic carriers of the disease. Um, they were providing a vital service to members of the public who were unable to um, drive their own vehicles, who perhaps were un uneasy about using public transport. So they've carried on providing a really important service. Um, we ceased the driving medicals just for a short duration. They are gradually being recovered, again, because the uh, medics were diverted onto the, the acute care in relation to COVID. So uh, we felt we couldn't obviously override that. Um, and again, we've tried to support the trade in terms of making changes to the way that we ask for payment for license fees. Um, we've maintained the weekly appointments for vehicle renewals with COVID safe processes. Um, so drivers have still been able to come to the offices. We've handed over the plates outside of the office. Um, we've kept that going so that the vehicles are appropriately badged up for uh, the reassurance of, of customers. Um, 
we've taken additional steps for consideration of the medical status of drivers where we've um, we've not been able to get the medicals, but also to look at the those that are self isolating and shielding to make sure that we can figure them as part of our recovery plan. Um, and also that it's included taking vehicles off the road that aren't working to ease pressures on insurance um, and again the requirement for the vehicle testing. Um, Alex has mentioned the advice issued via the Essex Resilience Forum for the safe use of taxis for drivers and passengers and we um, we specifically got those so that they were wiped clean uh, for use within the vehicles again just to help with part of the cleaning processes for, for COVID. Um, we're still in a position at the moment where we suspended the knowledge test for new drivers and new driver applications um, and we're just gearing up for some recovering on that. It, it wasn't possible to do that with the offices closed, uh, but there has been the ongoing of monitoring of ranks and other activity continued. Unfortunately, that's put quite a lot of pressure on Alex. She's been doing a grand job out there. Uh, we have both been out and about around um, just sort of check on just routine monitoring as what, what's been going on out there. So moving on to Licensing Act, again, there's been an awful lot of work on provision and providing advice in relation to COVID secure um, activities for takeaways initially. So a lot of businesses could actually continue, the food businesses and pubs could continue to offer takeaway um, and they are subsequently reopening on the 4th of July. So we've been making sure that we've been visiting uh, giving advice to businesses. There's been an awful lot of work that's been going on. My team have never been so busy um, in terms of monitoring reopening arrangements and provision of advice there. We're currently gearing up for pavement licenses under the Business and Planning Act. So there's a new piece of legislation which the government have been uh, trying to uh, push through at the moment, which will help to allow businesses to make more use of their outside space. So if it's a restaurant um, or a pub that perhaps has some space outside the business, then it, that it just creates a, um, an expedited process for the issue of pavement licences. Um, that's not actually come in quite as quickly as we anticipated, but we believe that will be out within the next two weeks. Um, so again, the graduated enforcement approach in relation to annual fees. So normally, um, if a licensed premises doesn't pay their annual fee, we would suspend the license. But um, at the direction of government, we haven't been um, suspending their license. It's something that we will keep under review as part of our graduated enforcement approach. Um, visits for licensing of animal related licensing establishments has all, also been halted. Again, it's very difficult, particularly a lot of them are based in domestic premises, but we are forming that was, is forming part of our recovery plan. So we're just in the process of uh, reviewing our risk assessments at the moment for that area as well. Um, and like many um, parts of the council, um, we believe that there is impact on income as a result of business closures during COVID-19. I'm talking about the lockdown closures, although we do anticipate that some businesses are going to struggle to keep going even after the restrictions have been lifted. And this is something that we're going to have to be monitoring on an ongoing basis. Um, and we're in regular consultation with finance on that as an issue. Um, as I say, we'd already introduced phase payments early on for taxi drivers and vehicle proprietors, um, although we know that there are a number that have not renewed, which Keith has alluded to, and we anticipate that the numbers will probably fall. We've got our big renewal year for drivers this year, um, and we are expecting an impact on that unless there is significant improvement in uh, passenger demand. And unfortunately, as I say, unknown impacts in terms of longer term as lockdown eases. So, as I say, I'd really like to say thank you to the team because I think they've done a fantastic job. Um, they kept it going, hopefully reasonably seamlessly for the trade, although Keith can probably provide a view on that. Um, just going to say, are there any questions? Although one thing I would mention um, is, and Keith, I, was, I wasn't sure whether or not he'd be here tonight, is that Mark Waller, who is the chair of the Hackney Carriage Association, has decided, I think, as partly as a result of COVID, to uh, retire early. Um, so he will be handing over the mantle to a, another chair who will be elected as part of the um, annual meeting, AGM, I think, for the Hackney Carriage Association. 
So uh, thanks go to Mark for his uh, work for licensing committee over the past past few Mark years. Waller. Mark Waller, that's it. <laughs> and so that's me done. Yeah. If there are any questions at all, then I'll be happy to take those. Oh, members, just let me have a second, please. Um, I would like to thank Mark Waller for all the input he has put into the license in committee. I'd like to thank you very much and have a happy retirement. Now over to members. Who's that? Councillor Holliman. I can see you now. Councillor Holliman, the floor is yours. And then Councillor Sargent. Thank you, Chair. Um, and then Councillor Kirkman. Uh, I'm obviously aware that um, uh, this uh, meeting is being recorded and, and I think it's live on YouTube as it happens. So um, uh, I fully understand if you're not able to answer this at the moment, Rachel, but um, there has been a bit of chatter and I've been contacted uh, a couple of times now about a resurgence of the puppy farming uh, in the area. And um, I'm just wondering whether you wanted to address that now or whether we, sh we should do that offline. I think I think there's uh, there's sorry, chair, if that's all right. Um, that's I think there's a there's a couple of things here um, without talking uh, specific cases. I think I can say enough to say that the um, the uh, puppy seller who was in Basildon for a number of years is no longer in Basildon um and um there's some ongoing work there the legislation changed earlier this year to prevent people from selling puppies that um that they hadn't bred themselves so pet shops pet vendors people selling from home puppies from home are no longer allowed to do that it's now against the law um whether or not it's still happening probably um and i think again it's one of those things that we will have to um look for that intelligence so officers will be keeping an eye on um, online um, advertising sites as they've done over over a period of time just to, to see whether or not we can see any patterns of um, activity uh, so I'm very happy to take a discussion offline if you have some information which might uh, point us in the direction of what is going on um, but I think it, actually with the legislation changes that we've got that should make it easier to actually lock down on some of these particular activities. <clears throat> and I'm sure all of us are very pleased that any help to stop puppy farming is a good help. Thank you. Now it's Councillor Sargent's turn next. Councillor Sargent. Yes, I've just just muted um, just unmuted. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Thanks, thanks to Rachel for the um, the presentation, and I hope we can um, be sent the slides. I did write to um, Rachel and the chairman last yeah. week because I was quite concerned yeah. about recovery plans, and I know um, this evening uh, Rachel's covered the uh, the taxi and private hire, but. Um, we all know that COVID's taken a toll on our business community. And I just wanted to know, Chairman, what the plans are for the, um, the businesses emerging from this um, pandemic lockdown. Um, other, other, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I've not finished yet. Um, oh, Chairman. no, sorry. It's all right. Um, I'm keen to know the administration's views on the recovery plan uh, many businesses are waiting for advice and guidance to get to get themselves up and running again. It's important that we understand the council's approach and the plans that you have in place. Um, so, um, would you know? In my letter, I spoke of um, licensing temporary uh, changes of license uh, in in the in the. Um, like for uh, hairdressers, if they aren't getting the trade um, that they do, can they have a, a licensing change of use for for something else? You know that that's just one thing, as a you know as a starter. So, what are your you know what's your plans, Chairman, for our business community? I can I can offer it 
offer a, a, an answer from the officer perspective, if that's the, if that's okay, Chair. Yep. Um, so um, from our perspective, uh, as I think I mentioned, we've been working with businesses right from the start. So uh, providing advice for those that could be open, those ones that had to close. Um, we, we advised all the food businesses in terms of what they could continue to do around takeaway. Um, and, and worked with them. We worked with them throughout. So I had officers sort of patrolling the high streets, uh, walking up and down the high streets, talking to businesses, giving out advice and information um, and really being a visible pre presence out there. Um, I think we've managed to keep, I'm hopeful that we've managed to keep a, a reasonable, reasonably level playing field as a result of that. So uh, fortunately, we've not had to serve any closure notices or prohibition notices on businesses that were opening illegally, which I think is testament to the, um, the steps that officers have taken to work with those businesses and make sure it was they were clear in terms of whether or not they could open or not. Um, subsequently, um, I've been working with Hugh Reynolds, you may know him in the environmental services team in relation to the reopening of the high streets. Um, and we've been holding regular Zoom meetings with both Billericay and Wickford businesses, particularly to uh, talk through their concerns about the reopening of the high streets, how we've, the sorts of measures that we've put in place to support the social distancing in the high streets. Um, and we've also used some of the uh, funding from the high street reopening fund to um, employ as a temporary measure a, I can't remember exactly what his title is now, High Streets um, Re Relationship. I think it's High Streets Re uh, Relationship Officer, um, who again will be going out and talking to the businesses specifically to understand what their issues and concerns are and try to support them. We've built up some really good relationships with the businesses in the High Streets. Um, it's taken a little while to get to that point. I think there's not been any sort of like town centre management or chambers of commerce that we've been able to engage with previously. And this has actually given us that opportunity. So we've got some real regular contacts going with the businesses now. So this to so this relationship officer will be good to, to build those and actually say, well, what, what do you now want as a business? How can we support you as part of the high street? Uh, we've also paid for quite significant advertising as well for businesses to support them. Um, in terms of the, the reopening of the high streets. So I'm hopeful that there will be, there will definitely unfortunately be some that don't make it, I'm sure. The legislation, um, I think with the Business and Planning Act and I think beyond as well, there's a, talk, a lot of talk from the government about changing the legislation to make it far easier for businesses to change their activities and just gen generally uh, lifting some of the restrictions around planning. So giving um building sites for example longer before they actually have to start commence works um and and also uh not actually requiring them to get planning permission in all cases so possibly the example i think you gave as councillor was uh, a hairdresser perhaps who wanted to then change to a takeaway food premises that potentially i believe will be something that could be done under the changes uh under the planning legislation so hopefully that's given you some uh, I, a feel for some of the activity that's been going on as we've tried to support the high streets through reopening. Um, can I ask, um, can I ask you, uh, well, one question for you and then I'll come on to the chairman. Um, as you know, we have um, quite a number of community centres as well um, within, our, within the borough. Um, I know necessarily and environmental health at the moment they're all closed and I will declare an interest because I run one of those such halls at, at Note Bridge so there are so many um, COVID restrictions and I do understand that some of our um, pre-customers and future customers have been speaking to environmental health particularly the early years uh, community and um, it's very, very difficult for us because they're run by volunteers. And how can we take on such heavy compliance? Um, it doesn't appear that that sector, you know, the, the, the voluntary community sector, it, it seems, I'm, I could be wrong, I'm just asking, um, what supports can they be offered? 
if any. Oh. Again, I can give. I, I didn't hear most of that, to be honest. A couple. I can I can give a, an officer's perspective again from that. Um, so obviously the, there were there were significant government grants that came through to the council. I know quite a bit of money was given out. I don't know whether or not how how much of the early years sector benefited, benefited from that at all. I I'm, unfortunately haven't got the, any information to hand on that side of things. Um, and we're working um, with Grant Taylor and Kirsty O'Connell in terms of. Uh, reopening of the community centres as well at the moment. It's it's hugely challenging. I wish I had an answer that I could give you just to um, to allay some of the concerns. But it, 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 we're working in an environment where we have got so many pieces of guidance uh, relating to one premises. It's been it. I, I don't think we've necessarily found our way through it yet, um, and, and 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 it's changing almost daily. Um, so we're so we're having to we're having to work with with de quite detailed guidance, which is then referring you off to other other pieces of guidance. So we're trying to give appropriate advice around that, um, but unfortunately, that does make it more difficult. And I think as a local authority, we're in a particularly difficult position because we're expected we're community leaders. So we're sort of we're trying to achieve the the best standards possible that we can to comply with the guidance. Um, so I think that's what we're working to. We are giving lots of advice and guidance to all sorts of businesses. I've, I've dealt with so many different inquiries throughout the whole of lockdown. It's been a real challenge for everybody. Um, we're trying to be very pragmatic because at the end of the day, it's guidance. It's nothing, there's nothing uh, legal in terms of what gov.uk is issuing. Um, and, and as we know, as Councillor Holliman's alluded to, the guidance is changing all the time. So in terms of our understanding of the virus and how it behaves and how it's transmitted is changing all the time. So in a very wordy way, I haven't answered it <laughs> because I don't know that there is an answer. I think we're all feeling our way through it. And I think to some extent we have to just try some of the different, uh, different techniques, different ways of operating. Um, to try and get to a point where where there is viability, which is a huge challenge. So, will the um, can the um, associations? Because most of most of the halls are um, Basling Council halls anyway, leased and taken on by the volunteers. And you know, obviously, they've lost their income. There's been no income since mid March. They're eager to get back. And um, it's difficult because there is no, I mean, yes, um, most of us have benefited from the council grants and uh, it's come, it's come in extremely handy and particularly in our case, it's been, and I'm sure in all cases, it's been used very, very wisely and it's helping us out tremendously. Um, any help that can be given to get us to open, I mean, we will be opening gradually, but um, um, thank you for that, Rachel. I'm sure that um, we can uh, look forward to some, you know, some further information and guidance as we go along and as the guidance uh, becomes less foggy. I think that's all I can. That's all I can say and becomes a bit more understandable. Um, and yeah, thank you for that. And if I can come back to yourself, Chairman, mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you from an administration, um, you know, your, your um, Chairman of Licensing from the administration point of view, what plans has your administration got to, um, you know, to, to help the, the business group? Rachel's give us the, the, uh, the kind of officer, the, what the officers are doing, but from the uh, the administration side. What what plans has uh, your administration got that you can relay to us? Well, I think um, as you know, we're replaying uh, Basildon Town Centre, and when all that is up and running, that will make a, a good uh, end result. Is what I'm saying. Well, I mean, it's the recap, you know, it's the, it's not, it's the businesses and getting them back up and running, giving the appropriate advice and guidance. You know, I didn't know whether there was, like, Rachel's got some kind of recovery plans 
what is the uh, what recovery plan is well to be honest uh, this is the first time that it has been brought up tonight so we're in the infant stages of this but I'm quite happy to chair another meeting on this uh, no I think I did write I, did I write know you did, but uh, the other councillors wasn't involved. So um, if everybody gets around the table and would like to put some suggestions up, that would be a brilliant idea. Well, I don't think we can, oh. you know, you're the, you're the administration chairman. I don't think it's our, you know, it's not for the opposition to... Um, uh, no, I, I don't consider anybody here is the opposition. I consider everybody here on licensing. Uh, it's not party political. Uh, this is not a party political. No, 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 it isn't. Uh, chairman, this is to do with the, the recovery of our businesses so that they can uh, recover appropriately and continue to uh, support the, you know, the people of the borough and we in turn should be trying to support them. So I suppose what you're saying in essence is that there is no plan at the moment from the administration. No. Thank you, well, I'll leave it there then, Chairman, thank you. Oh, okay. Is this their battery's running low? Does that mean anything? Hang on a second. Right. Uh, uh. Should I send to her up then in a polite way? Right. Councillor Copeman next. Councillor uh, Copeman. You, Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Oh, that's okay. So I've got a cat jumping all over me. I can right. see it's very pretty. I like cats. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just back to taxi, look, taxi and private hire licensing. Um, okay. Obviously, we've got a, um, a company have a three year license for that. And obviously, you have to pay for three years up front. Now, can we either look to reintroduce annual licensing or Hang on. Uh, defer payments or something? Thank you. Hang on, and uh, Rachel's got the answer to this because this was brought up as well about the payments and there is something in the system for this. He's out up at the deferred payments, you know, what was mentioned for the cab drivers. Yes, so sorry. Uh, that's, a, that's all right, I won't tell you what Rachel was doing. <laughs> that was a decision that was sort of taken uh, early on really was to transport the um, the trade in terms of giving some flexibility of the payment so um alex might be able to give you alex can probably give a little bit better explanation than i can because i'm losing my words now <laughs> i've just been scrabbling around on the floor i do apologize no that's fine um yeah so all the vehicle licenses are one-year licenses <clears throat> and they've all been offered deferred payment fee uh, payment schemes so what it is, is that they pay um, a phased fee over six months. Um, so it's not all coming out at the same time. It's over the space of six months and it's a monthly Thank direct debit. Um, and uh, the driver's so badges that are bid due to be renewed next year, um, they That's have so the options to do <laughs> one, two or three year licenses. The vehicle licenses are only one year licenses. The operator's licenses are five-year licenses. However, I do believe there is an option for a, a, a smaller one. Um, but yeah, those, those phase, fee do, phase fee payments are in there and there are options for drivers and um, for one-year licenses. Thank uh, you sorry, much. does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Any other members? No? I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of all members of licensing to take say a big thank you for all the officers for are working so hard underneath this virus and all the extra stress and strain it's put on them. So thank you very much. So if there's no other question, Andy, are you waving at me? Alex, you want me? 
Hey, sorry, yes, please, Chair. Um, just very quickly, um, I, I would like to thank the taxi trade as well, the taxi and private hire trade, because they have been very supportive with us through all the changes that we've made. Um, and they have been uh, excellent being out there and obviously being in contact with us and, and being patient with us as well. So um, they're doing a wonderful job out there. Thank you, Alex. That was very good of you. Thank you. And I agree with everything as the members say. Yes, Councillor Sargent. Yes, Councillor. Thank you, Chairman. I just like to wish the trade um, to have a good recovery and I hope his business picks up very soon. We must get some stuff out there to get our residents of the borough to use our taxis and give them plenty of trade. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, thank you. No, and I agree with all the other comments that the taxi drivers are a, a life. Uh, is that the end of the meeting? I'm sorry, um, Rachel, what's happened, please? Power, the power's gone on the laptop, on uh, Councillor Clancy's laptop. We would, that's what we were trying to scrabble around doing, but we, couldn't, we can't actually figure out a way to, uh, couldn't see what was wrong with it at all. So uh, that's the, so it's, it's died. Uh, can we wrap it up then? I'm assuming, I'm assuming we can, Kemi. I don't, there's any other, anything yes, else um, on the agenda? There's nothing else on the agenda. The chair was just saying that. Thanks. So we will take this meeting as um, closed. Thank you. Good night, everyone. See you next Good night. time. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.